to tell us about the new strategic plan at the School of Population and Global Health. And our hope is to have a really good um, conversation about how we can enhance our interactions uh, at CORE uh, with SBGH, but, but also across our clinical epidemiology community at our hospital-based research institutes. So I'll introduce Dr. Evans. If I read his entire bio sketch, we'd be here a bit longer. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you like the, the, the sort of star power points. So um, he has been uh, Senior Director of Health, Nutrition and Population Global Practice at the World Bank Group, um, Director of the Health Equity Theme at the Rockefeller Foundation, Assistant Director General at the WHO. He led the Commission on Social Determinants of Health. He was responsible for their annual report. He's now Director and Assistant Dean of the School of Population and Global Health. He's Associate VP of Global Policy and Innovation at McGill. And in his spare time, he's Executive Director of Canada's COVID-19 Immunity Task Force because everyone needs a hobby. So here we are, and we're really looking forward to a conversation with you, Tim. Well, well thanks, Kabiri, for uh, the uh, generous introduction. Uh, my children wouldn't recognize me. Uh, and, uh, and thanks, everybody, for joining. Um, uh, I, I'm uh, going to give you a brief overview of where we are. I had the opportunity, actually, just when I arrived at McGill, to have a great session at the core. Uh, in, in, in a time that we never recognize now that uh, was congregate and, uh, and, and things, but um, there's been a lot of work and I want to update you on where we are with the school, but in particular focus on the areas for collaboration with the core. Uh, and as that's one of the priorities uh, in the context of the strategy. So, um, uh, Okay, so we, we have been doing this strategic planning. Uh, we started with the 2016 strategic plan document that was approved by the Senate of McGill, which really got everything going, which was actually a really good document and provided a lot of the uh, framework for thinking, but we've supplemented that with a set of working groups, uh, 15 different working groups on different topics and subjects, and that included many people from uh, the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences, town halls retreats, we've had consultations across the university, um, we've had advisory committee inputs, and we've had oversight from uh, the FMHS, uh, things like the, the Dean's Operation Council and Faculty Council and things like that. And the idea was to understand the current state of play uh, with respect to what's happening in the Gill landscape in Canada, and globally, but also then identify future priorities in the, the areas that the uh, universities typically work in, research, education, service, and then think about uh, partners uh, and uh, resource mobilization and results. Uh, so that's the big picture. We obviously had to update our context. And as we all know, we're into pandemics. Uh, those pandemics are part of a much more complex set of health problems we're facing related to syndemics and climate change, and they span the spectrum of infectious, uh, 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 chronic, emergent, neglected, uh, under, over nutri uh, nutrition uh, and uh, emergencies. Um, but uh, in addition, uh, we've seen uh, an evolution and a prominence uh, of systemic inequalities uh, that cross-cut virtually every health issue, and those are some of the, uh, the stratifiers that are their most prominent. Um, systemic uh, systems performance shortfalls as well, um, and we see those in the context of our pandemic response in terms of delivery of vaccines, but also uh, in terms of access to care uh, and uh, other efficiency measures. Uh, and we're in a vortex of change uh, that relates to health tech and digital futures. Uh, uh, syndemics, uh, the metabolomics or the, uh, the proteomics, uh, uh, data science, massive issues related to ethics and trust uh, and policy. So these are some of the things that uh, are uh, conditioning uh, where the school needs to position itself. Uh, this is just the sort of the, uh, the brave new world of global health. Uh, Richard Horton uh, uh, suggested that uh, COVID is not a pandemic, but a syndemic, and that was linked to its, uh, its strong 
uh, risk uh, associated with chronic disease, uh, as well as its uh, uh, tendency to uh, gravitate to areas of deprivation, either defined by racialized communities or uh, other socioeconomic indicators. Uh, and uh, in the BMJ in 2020, sort of a, a big new picture of the world that we're moving into in global health. Um, I had an interesting conversation with a colleague, a Norwegian colleague uh, who I'd worked with for many years the other day. And he said, Tim, uh, I no longer work in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs um, to do global health. I now work in the Ministry of Health to do global health uh, because all health is global. And this, this was, uh, uh, I think, an interesting thing that, that we're not only now looking at global health from the lens of uh, charitable efforts to work in low and middle income countries, that's a big part of it. Uh, but uh, as we've seen in this pandemic, uh, uh, our health is intimately and uh, intrinsically linked uh, to the health of the globe. Um, so uh, in that context, uh, EPI is uh, front and center on everybody's uh, uh, radar screen. Uh, this is the bookstore at McGill, uh, and uh, the EPI books are now um, on the, uh, the front uh, shelves. Uh, Teresa Gierkos' uh, uh, publications can be accessed at the McGill uh, School, they're bestsellers. Um, and it's really this issue where EPI has moved from uh, the, uh, the backwaters to uh, uh, the mainstream, um, there's some real questions as to whether it should be uh, in the nonfiction or the fiction section of the bookstores. And I say that because uh, as many have noted, uh, when everybody becomes an epidemiologist overnight, um, uh, there's a lot of stuff that uh, might not meet uh, the, uh, the criteria for, for publication uh, and, and real, really good stuff. Um, however, it does represent an important opportunity and we're seeing it in student demand for programs. Um, and that really relates me to the, another important issue, which is that it's really important for us to understand the expectations of the next generation of le learners. And, and this is where they want to go with their education. It's the uh, residents uh, that are coming into resident training or medical students or nursing students uh, or public health students. Uh, they are strongly uh, in general borderless, boundaryless and, and hungry for real world experience. And so how we provide and shape opportunities for them, I think is one of our uh, major responsibilities. Um, of course, we're not building uh, starting from scratch. And so in that context, um, uh, we are building on strengths. Um, uh, if you look across the composite units of the school, Department of Epi, Biostats, Institute for Health and Social Policy, Biomedical Ethics Unit and Global Health Programs, lots of depth and excellence uh, in research, education and service. Um, uh, uh, there's uh, top-notch education programs uh, that are oversubscribed um, and uh, produce excellent graduates that find jobs. Uh, we've got strong campus-wide uh, connections and collaborations and a proven track record um, and appetite for engagement beyond the ivory tower. So it's a, it's a great uh, a starting position. Uh, there are, however, some gaps and uh, we're missing some depth in some key disciplines and sciences. Um, uh, we have challenges meeting the demands for teaching. Um, there are issues related to financing of education, uh, which are very uh, significant, uh, particularly within the faculty, uh, in terms of how to talk, how to manage access, uh, but also um, making sure students get appropriate support. Um, particularly sensitive at this time to EDI issues uh, around racial diversity. And uh, when we look at it, we think there's room for improvement in linkages with clinical schools and departments. And in that regard, we've identified as one of the priorities, uh, something we call healing the schism. And this is based off a book that uh, Carr White wrote. And Carr White um, actually was a Canadian who ended up at Johns Hopkins University um, as a professor. 
of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, clinical epidemiology and public health, but he wrote this book, Healing the Schism, Epidemiology, Medicine, and the Public's Health, in which he argued that uh, there was a false dichotomy between epidemiology and, uh, uh, and public health or uh, care and public health. And so he said, what we really need to do is we need to bring these together. And I think that's very much uh, the spirit of the strategy, which was to look at efforts to align education, research, and service around uh, collective and common purpose. Uh, and I'll describe some of the uh, discrete efforts on that front uh, uh, and hope we can get some comments. So uh, this is uh, uh, the idea. We have a crisis on our hands, uh, but it's uh, an opportunity. So. Uh, we've rearticulated the vision, mission, and values of the school. I won't take you deep into these, but in general, uh, uh, we want advanced knowledge for improved health, health equity, and well-being. Uh, we want to be known as a global leader and valued partner in the generation and translation of that knowledge. And we have a set of values uh, that relate fundamentally to the integrity and excellence of our work, but also that as a responsive partner, we're accountable and we learn to do better. Um, structurally, we've moved from uh, uh, what was proposed in the Senate document as a six division structure uh, to a three department structure. And we think this allows us uh, to have greater critical mass uh, earlier um, and also to preserve some of the synergies um, that we think are particularly important. Uh, for example, we think epi and biostats go hand in hand. And so we are, are bringing them together in the department. But so too does the practice of public health and the practice of global health. And so we brought them together in this department of global and public health. Aligning the departments are three cross-cutting programs which relate to research, education and service. And those are the core functions of universities, so nothing there. Uh, but the, the detail in each of those is uh, our areas where we'll be trying to uh, build the school uh, with a, through what we call cross-cutting priorities. And these are usually high profile centers and labs where you can generate um, opportunities um, that align folks, uh, not only within the school, but across uh, the faculty um, around specific issues, which are thought to be equally important uh, from various perspectives. And then you can, through those efforts, um, uh, strengthen uh, core functions related particularly to education. So in that context, we've identified four areas of focus with respect to um, working with uh, uh, the School of Medicine, uh, the Faculty of Medicine, uh, and today just focusing on core. And it's under this sort of healing the schism priority. But these are the four, trials innovation platform, uh, new models of care, uh, digital health, and education initiatives. So I'm just gonna uh, briefly describe those. And uh, I really love uh, that this part of the presentation, we really, um, it generates uh, suggestions, feedback, um, ideas uh, uh, with respect to uh, this collaboration. On trials innovation, um, uh, clinical trials, uh, but not only clinical trials, trials looking to uh, promote new interventions, efficacious interventions to promote health or improve health or, or improve care are undergoing a lot of dynamic transformation at the moment. Um, the fact that we have uh, 11 uh, vaccines uh, uh, through phase three clinical trials for COVID-19 in a year uh, is indicative of that transformation. Uh, McGill has got a tremendous amount of potential to do a lot more in this area. It's had a history uh, uh, where it's uh, had ups and downs and which we need to be cognizant of. And it's an area where there's a, a lot of convergence uh, between the school that has epi, biostats, ethics that are critical ingredients to trials, but also the, the school of uh, medicine uh, and the hospital research institutes uh, and also MI4. So those are some of the, the, the partners that would be critical in this. Um, there's some very important assets to build on. And as Kabiri has informed us, there's a Biosats Consulting Group at CORE. 
There's a data capture and management platform. Uh, there's also now a McGill Cancer Consortium it's called MC Squared. Um, tech, catchy name, uh, but that's got a clinical trials for cancer effort that's moving as well. So Susan Kahn and Louise Pilot uh, are, are putting together a working group, which would include uh, uh, leadership from these various areas uh, to try and see how we might uh, create uh, a much uh, more significant uh, presence for McGill in the, in the trials innovation space. And I've spoken with David Eidelman about this. Uh, he's gung-ho uh, and very, uh, very supportive. Um, and of course he sees this as a faculty of medicine opportunity, which it is. Uh, the school is part of this effort. Uh, it's not a proprietor in any ways. But he also says we really need to catch up and look at some other institutions are ahead of us. Uh, and he mentions, uh, other schools that start with MC, uh, but don't finish with Gill, uh, but rather master. Uh, so uh, there, there's some other schools out there that are, are ahead of us, uh, perhaps. Uh, and the idea would be we look and learn uh, and we see how we can position uh, this uh, as uh, perhaps something that's going to be a, a great opportunity for many uh, who are interested in this area. Um, in terms of new models of care, every efficacious intervention that is comes out of a, a, a clinical trial needs to get delivered. And uh, uh, this is an area where delivery of interventions that make a difference uh, often uh, transcend a false dichotomy between public health and clinical care. Uh, and this is that we've seen, for example, how you manage infection protection and uh, the management of sick patients with COVID is, is critically important in hospitals and critically important for public health, right? So uh, I think uh, this is an area where we think um, the school has a joint interest uh, in, in teaming up with uh, our clinical partners. Uh, there's boundless learning opportunities across borders and contexts. Um, and uh, these are just some of the areas, the focused areas, where there's a lot of work going on at McGill, uh, where we could be um, uh, seizing this opportunity uh, to understand what, what constitutes successful delivery to people who are without homes or recently arrived immigrants um, who are living in difficult circumstances. And, and this corresponds with a, a growing interest in knowledge and delivery in systems sciences. Uh, and what we're finding is that there's growing demand from students and decision makers for this type of knowledge and these competencies. So um, one area that uh, we've been collaborating with the Department of Family Medicine uh, in the last, just since January on looking at this convergence on delivery um, and new models of care with respect to primary care and public health. And, and today we had an absolutely fascinating uh, a seminar with uh, Dr. Vanya Jimenez and Kate Mulligan. Uh, Vanya was telling us, us about the, uh, the Maison Bleu efforts um, and uh, just fascinating uh, stories about uh, managing uh, uh, care to pregnant women uh, for uh, in settings that um, uh, uh, women coming from uh, places in Africa or South Asia and uh, and having to situate their care in, in the local setting. Um, uh, enormously interesting in terms of how that's being done with uh, uh, good outcomes. And then Kate Mulligan talking about social prescription. Uh, and how uh, they're really these innovative efforts to uh, bring to bear social determinants of health as opportunities to uh, change the relationship of patients uh, with the healthcare system. So these are the sorts of things where there's uh, just tremendous opportunity for learning that I think uh, we'd like to try and uh, take advantage of more systematically in the new models of care. The third area is around uh, harnessing digital innovation for health. Uh, these are some of the, the spectrum of things from drones that are, are programmed to deliver blood, life-saving blood supplies in places where supply chains uh, by road are not functional. Uh, this whole new M-Health 
effort, which has been accelerated by COVID and robotization. Um, uh, this was a triage robot that I met in China uh, a year or two ago. But um, on this front, um, uh, there's more data and computing capacity than ever before. McGill and Montreal are a hotbed of activity. Uh, there's a, a white paper and digital innovation symposium uh, that's being organized on June 2nd and 3rd, uh, which has an, uh, uh, an expectation of looking at how to build capacity for a learning health system, that's here at McGill, uh, and a new concentration in digital health in the MSc in experimental medicine uh, that's being led by Robin Tamblin and David Buckridge. So we think this is a, a nice area of convergence, and I think it underpins and supplements both the trials innovation platform uh, and the new models of care. So this is a third area that uh, looks uh, promising. The last uh, area is around our education programs. And on that front, uh, we think there are opportunities for a better collaboration with existing programs uh, between, uh, at, between the faculty and the hospitals. Um, and here we've got uh, the MSc in experimental medicine, the MSc PhD in family medicine and primary care, and a need to iron out issues related to teaching and supervision of students. And, and, I, and I, say, I say this because there's a lot of history here, and, and I think we, we shouldn't ignore some of the tensions, uh, but I'm confident uh, if we're, we're going to be serious and act as an institution, we can, we can find mechanisms uh, for synergy and win-win. Uh, part of that might come through the co-development of new programs, uh, the MSc in Experimental Medicine and Surgery and the Concentration in Digital Health. There's work now to revitalize the work in, uh, on clinical epi um, that's being led by Ari Nandi. And we had discussions about uh, developing a one-year MSCPH option for clinicians. So those are some of the things uh, that might help um, that uh, increase that synergy, but it's not only new programs, it's new modes of program delivery. And, and that's sort of looking at ways of accommodating access to programs, which don't mean taking full-time one or two years out of your life and doing this perhaps more progressively through stackable certificates, modules, and executive programs. So Robert Platt, um, Interim Director of Epi and Biostats is co-leading on this with Charles Larson, who's the Interim Director of our Department of Global and Public Health. Um, just wanted to say that uh, this is uh, uh, something that Robin uh, Tamlin put together on the new MSc in Experimental Medicine, looking at uh, digital innovation. And uh, she said, uh, we need to train a new cadre of clinician and informatics scientists to partner in developing and evaluating service innovations and utilizing new high volume streams of clinical and health related data from clinical systems, wearables and social media. So this is why we need the educational dimension of this uh, if we're going to uh, address those issues. And then finally, uh, Mark Roger, uh, who participated in our, our retreat on March 19th, I talked about his vision for training clinical investigators and why he thought the School of Public uh, Population Global Health might be helpful. And he noted a concerning trend, which is that over the last 20 years, um, uh, or 20 years ago, about 3% of physicians were physician scientists. And now it's less than 1%. And he pointed to a set of issues about the length of training and the challenges of managing a career as a physician scientist uh, that were discouraging people uh, from uh, uh, be, be pursuing careers of, as physician scientists. So uh, he feels that the school could be helpful in reviving uh, the physician scientist uh, career by train by providing training that is much more flexible. And so he was suggesting um, uh, looking at how we could make it more concurrent with clinical uh, with clinical training uh, and less sequential um, uh, uh, so that doesn't add extra years uh, to a full-time student uh, and and then uh, asking us to explore models uh, that uh, of modular asynchronous and executive MBA models. So I think those are some of the things where uh, we think uh, the school could be uh, value added, uh, but it's not because we're um, uh, 
uh, not interested in developing these programs ourselves. We think the school will be much more vibrant uh, uh, if we do develop these options, uh, working closely uh, with uh, the uh, uh, School of uh, Medicine. So uh, those are the four areas that I'm putting on the table and I would be great to have uh, feedback, suggestions, things that we're missing uh, and look forward to your, uh, your comments and thanks for your attention. So that's, thank you very much, Tim. I think it's really important for us to have a conversation. So I'll, I'll ask you maybe, Tim, if you could stop sharing the screen and hopefully everybody can uh, turn on their cameras. There we go. And um, if, if people could just type in their names, um, I'm gonna call out to you and help you um, go ahead and uh, uh, ask your questions. I hope you have lots of questions and comments. Um, so if you don't, I will call out to you. <laughs> so if, uh, if someone wants to start typing their name, they can go ahead and I will call out to you. Um, I will, I'll start while I'm waiting for a couple of names to come through. So I think, you know, the, 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 um, the backbone is there. I see the, the, in your presentation, but I did, as I commented to you uh, earlier today, I, I finally did read the strategic plan. And I think what, what, what I noticed was that if we're na not named, it feels like we're missing. So I would like to see in the strategic plan, the words School of Medicine, Department of Medicine, Department of PEDS, Center for Outcomes Research and Evaluation, uh, Center for Clinical Epi uh, at the LDI, to really see that these are um, the building blocks for, um, clinical epidemiology, which has implications in both clinical care and in public health, frankly. So until we're, we're named, it's sort of ambiguous as to where we fit. And, and actually, I do remember in 2019, I made that comment to you. I said, where are we in the organogram? So I think that we do need to be there. Um, and I just like your thoughts on that. Uh, great. Well, um, first, uh... Uh, that's in some respects music to my ears in the sense that uh, uh, the, the spirit of the school is to be a resource uh, for um, the faculty and uh, the university as a whole, uh, not uh, uh, a silo unto itself. Um, and uh, I think part of being responsible and being in naming is, uh, is to make sure that we're able to walk the talk on collaboration. Uh, and so I think uh, intent is uh, certainly there, but we uh, it really requires uh, some degree of specificity. And I think what we're trying to do is uh, uh, look at what some of those entry points for engagement are. Uh, so that's why you know we've put some of these things down um, and have begun discussions uh, with uh, leaders uh, in the School of Medicine and elsewhere um, uh, with respect to developing these as joint efforts. Um, uh, so that's one part of the response. I guess a second one, uh, Kabiri, uh, is, is more fundamentally uh, a governance challenge. And, and, and I think it relates to uh, how we might be able to uh, have uh, discussions with the leadership, uh, critical leaderships uh, that you're talking about with respect to the hospitals, the research institutes, and, and the departments in the School of Medicine um, on, on a regular basis that would uh, not become sort of uh, uh, things that everybody says, oh, another administrative hassle. Uh, but can uh, keep a, a live spirit of, um, of discussing and identifying opportunities um, that uh, we, could, uh, we could jointly pursue. And, and I'd be interested in people's ideas on whether that is a dedicated mechanism uh, that we create uh, or whether we try and do that in the context of some of our Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences uh, uh, governance mechanisms. But, so I see two ways of really addressing this, um, which is one, let's, let's develop that specificity through specific collaborative efforts uh, around these sorts of areas that I've identified today. And secondly, 
uh, let's uh, examine whether uh, we can't make space for um, uh, discussions on collaboration more generally, either through existing governance mechanisms in the faculty or perhaps thinking about something more specific. So I'm going to, um, uh, I'm actually going to uh, pass it to Sasha. Sasha, where are you? Dr. Vernatsky. Yeah, I don't know if um, it's valid, Sammy thinks it is, but I just, uh, Mark, Mark, Mark Roger had commented on, um, we need a solution to the decreasing numbers of uh, uh, clinicians, scientists, and um, it's always good, I think, to, like, sometimes it seems like the solution is obvious, but I think the more information you gather about any problem before you design the solution uh, is, um, is a good way to go about it. And, and I think that's true for a lot of things that we think, oh, that's an obvious solution. Uh, for all these things that we're, we're facing in terms of dealing with the realities of more, of so much digital information and how we're gonna incorporate that in our um, research in ways that we can then translate for, for regulators. So um, I don't have an, I, so anyway, that's any thought on that? Do we need, are there places where we still need to gather more information as we uh, design uh, potential solutions? Sure. I mean, I, two, two responses uh, quickly, Sasha. First, I think Mark's coming from a place where uh, I think he, he co-chaired or chaired a commission looking into the future of clinician scientists uh, over when he was at Ottawa. And so he spent a fair amount of his time looking at uh, this this issue. Um, so uh, I I think that's where he's coming from with respect to the concern. I haven't read that report, um, so I, this was just his uh, his recommendation at uh, at a retreat we held in March. Um, in terms of the issue of what what the best solutions are, I think absolutely um, uh, one should put those to the test. Uh, um, these may not be the best. There may be others that one has to look at. Um, so I wouldn't uh, wouldn't want to suggest that somehow this is going to fix it all. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I think one of the things that is important is to be sensitive to uh, expectations of learners. And, and sometimes I think we, we're too supply side oriented. Uh, we've got to listen and, and see where the learners want to go and to what extent are we being responsive. And, and I think some of the things that we do pick up and we've picked this up in discussions, for example, with our colleagues in, in family medicine uh, is uh, they see a lot of people wanting to do uh, uh, degree programs on a, on a modular basis rather than full-time continuous. So I think being sensitive to that is an important part of coming up with uh, uh, responses that uh, may not be the solution to the, clinic, clinical, uh, the clinician scientist problem, but may be important ways to accommodate demand for our education programs. I'm going to, I see Sasha's told me that Robin has her hand up, so I don't see hands, but Robin, please go ahead. Yeah, so thanks very much, Tim, for, for your presentation. I wanted to join again today because of, you know, I, can, I see this is continuously evolving. And so as you're hearing back from the community. So I just wanted to comment on three things. So one is this link between clinical departments uh, and the school. I think the clinical trials platform is going to be a great opportunity to explore how that should be ideally done. Uh, or not even ideally, but it will grow organically out of that. I don't think it's gonna be a top-down kind of approach. I think it's gonna be a bottom-up to try to figure out how to best uh, address the, both the need in that area and then the governance of kind of an infrastructure and the recruitment around that and the training around that and so on. So I think that's a great kind of pilot, if, if I could say that. Uh, our aspirations to be to build an institute for digital health innovation not just within the school, but across campus and across the academic health centers uh, is another um, you know, opportunity to look at governance structures and how that's best supported. So I really think that that's a way of actually trying to build the bridges because there's been history, as you probably know, about the relationships between the MUHC Research Institute and the university that 
I think continue to prevail in terms of discussions and negotiations. And I think that that is so counterproductive. So I think it's better to start off on a new foot uh, to actually take on these uh, new initiatives and see what best fits uh, for that plan. So it's just my two cents worth on, on that. So thanks again for continuing to listen to every to all of us uh, and evolve this sort of strategic direction uh, to address that. So thanks again. Great, thanks. Um, just, just to say, I think, <coughs> uh, reinforce the idea of, of learning uh, through specific efforts at collaboration uh, is, is critical. And so uh, I, I don't, uh, I, I've learned enough uh, in a little bit of time here to know that, that, that moving forward just with that child's innovation platform, uh, we'll, we'll have a lot of moving parts. Uh, and so uh, we've really got to, and that, the discussions I had with David Eidelman on this, where he illuminated all the, all of the things that we need to be thinking about. Uh, but uh, it will be uh, uh, something where we can learn. Uh, 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 and, uh, and similarly with the Institute of Digital Health Innovation. Could I call on, uh, Sammy is on the call, Sammy Suisa. So he's got a, a long a historical lens and a very important member of the department. Sammy, do you wanna go ahead and make some comments? There he is, okay. Yeah, thank you, Tim. Uh, I, I mean, we, we've, we've discussed this uh, extensively when you came to visit us at the, at the Jewish and uh, clearly we, we understand your uh, uh, we understand how you uh, support uh, the units uh, based in hospitals and the importance of that work in what we're calling global health. Uh, and, and we have a perfect example of the, you know, the, this pandemic. Uh, a, lot of the, uh, a lot of the work that has been done uh, politically in terms of this pandemic has been to uh, control what's going on in, in the hospitals and uh, and uh, you know the units based in hospitals are are out there and they can understand a lot of the uh, they can understand the research that uh, is needed uh, globally to uh, to affect uh, the decisions that are made uh, so so I, I I mean, I, I, I believe and, 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 and I believe strongly that, that you believe strongly about the importance of the, of, uh, uh, of the work that we do and the, and, and the importance of these units being based in, uh, inside uh, different hospitals. Uh, I, I'd like to uh, pick up on, on the point of clinician scientists because this is something that has bothered us for, for a very long time. I think that the, the very successful clinician scientists are in fact not clinician scientists. They are what I called scientist clinicians. Uh, and, and, and I think that's, that's an important distinction. Uh, and and that, 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 that play of words, I think, is, is important because they are first and foremost scientists. Of course, they have clinical work, but it is much less than other full-time clinicians. And their, their role is mostly scientists and we, we have many of them around us and, uh, and, and, and they are the very successful ones. So somehow I think when we talk about uh, clinician scientists, we have to make sure uh, that uh, we have a good mix of clinician scientists and, and scientist clinicians. Uh, and this way, I think we definitely have the tools to train them and to give them the best, uh, uh, the best methods uh, with which to do uh, the utmost uh, research. And this platform that Robin is, is working with the team on developing is gonna be a, an, an amazing platform. We, yes, we're late compared to other places, but I think we're gonna be way advanced in terms of uh, the capacities that we will have to use the platform and to, uh, to improve it. We have extremely strong methods people and with that, I think we'll, we, we can make this platform work very, very well. So I think uh, uh, somehow the, the, there is a need to sit with the politicians and to make sure that we can somehow change things so that we can do the work that we are here to do. So for example, clinician scientists or scientist clinicians, we need to work on half-prems or, 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 
uh, fifth, uh, you know, a prem divided by five or something like that, where you can have a scientist who work four days a week as a scientist and one day a week as a clinician. And somehow we need to uh, push somewhere, uh, use uh, the power of the university, the power of the board of the Senate or so to start uh, pushing in that direction so that we can advance science. And we understand the, the need here. The uh, 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 same thing with respect to access to data. We do studies using data from all around the world, except data from Quebec. This is unacceptable. The data are there, and somehow we should be able to answer questions about the effectiveness of a COVID vaccine, one dose after 90 days or after 120 days. We should, we have the data to do, to answer those questions, but somehow there is not the political will to do that. So maybe as a school, as a, the, the, we can start changing things. We can have now perhaps the, the we have this, this opportunity that Churchill talked about, and maybe this is the opportunity to change things in Quebec City about this issue, this specific issue here. So I think there are great things that we can do with the school, and there are great things that we can do together along with the hospital units uh, and uh, the, the, the new initiatives that are coming out, digital data platforms. Uh, you, you have tremendous opportunities and I think we, you can be Churchill. <laughs> Don't be Churchill all the way though. I'm gonna give one of our young clinician scientists or scientist clinicians an opportunity. Uh, Patricia Lee, you just left my screen. Where are you? You have- you I'm have, here, okay. I'm here. Okay. Yes, yes. I mean, I agree with a lot of what was just said previously about the scientist clinician issue. I know for pediatricians anyways, across Canada and within our own institution, it has a lot to do with funding rather than, you know, we're all trained for it and eventually we drop off because our clinical duties overtake and all that. Anyways, um, my question was actually just, I may have missed it, but the cross-cutting fee um, are these meant to kind of organically develop and, and kind of present themselves? Um, or is there some kind of strategy or vision as to how, um, you know, what these may look like or what these may be? Thanks. Um, so uh, I, I think the, uh, we've got a couple of, the, uh, of areas that uh, have sort of risen to the top. Um, in terms of the cross-country cutting themes, and uh, I presented those. Um, the reasons for them is that those are areas where there's been uh, collective interest. And so I think the primary driver is to have collective interest. Uh, they're not the only ones, uh, and, uh, they, uh, and there'll be new ones as, is as, as, as issues arise. Um, so. I think um, if, you know, part of the beauty of universities is they're incredibly um, uh, diverse and resourceful uh, and in many respects more responsive than you might expect, uh, because as issues emerge, um, uh, individuals uh, from different parts of an institution mobilize. Uh, and I think what we've seen around the pandemic is a clear example of that is people are doing things that you would never have expected. Uh, so just to name one, for example, um, uh, an area of convergence that uh, is, I'm quite excited about, not specific to the Faculty of Medicine, but uh, is uh, we've got a, a really interesting core of modelers now. Um, that are emerging from different places. Um, and uh, it relates uh, to EBOH, but also bioengineering um, uh, or biomedical, uh, bi yeah, bioengineering and, and, and also um, uh, some other areas. So th those are things where uh, as, as there's convergence around issues and there's energy, uh, uh, those might be opportunities for other uh, things to come through. So I, my sense is we should not try and put a straitjacket on uh, identification of those opportunities. Uh, they should be, uh, uh, people should see that. It should be encouraged uh, to take initiative. And if you can uh, move those things uh, and, and work with them in, in ways that uh, find uh, partners and, and, and mobilize energy, human resources, and, and, and financing, uh, I think that's what makes a, a university particularly vibrant. So 
um, I'm going to turn it to Ben, Ben Smith. He's uh, another scientist clinician. Thanks, Kaberi, uh, and thank you, Tim. Uh, so this comment, uh, so I have a short lens, I guess, in comparison to uh, Sammy, but um, and the, the vision that you presented was, was, seemed really good to me. The comment is perhaps a, more practical, and I apologize if that's, that's not exactly what you were looking for, but I, I do think it's actually relevant to achieve the vision. Um, working at CORE specifically and in doing sort of an informal survey of some, some other really top tier productive uh, sort of schools or departments of, of epi and population health around North America. I was wondering what thought you put into the sort of physical organization and specifically with respect to core. A sense I have is that there's a lot of scientists, clinician, clinician scientists at, at the hospital institutes uh, who are all kind of busy running in and out with their clinical services. And there's a lack of PhD methodologists who are in physical proximity, you know, sitting nearby where, where these ideas get exchanged, often informally, often at the water cool and, and cooler. And, and, it, and it may be sort of thought of as, as sort of a bit hand wavy, but I do think that that's, that can really elevate the quality of the research, both from us, the clinician scientists learning about the cutting edge methods and perhaps the methodologists hearing about the pressing clinical questions and, and sort of a synergy there that at least there's anecdotally, like a lot of these top tier places are, are, are trying to get that physical proximity to happen. And I understand COVID is upon us now, but we have to think beyond COVID. And has any thought been, been put into that with respect to just that physical organization? Thanks. And I'll just comment, Ben, that that was our setup at, uh, before CORE at uh, ClinEpi, but it was a smaller group. I think that's what they have uh, at, uh, at the Jewish as well. Like we, you know, EBOH members sat alongside with clinician scientists uh, at the uh, hospital-based research institutes, and that's why we've been successful. And we need some more of these uh, we need new positions uh, between uh, um, uh, you know, the School of Population and Global Health and the Department of Medicine so we can recruit people that want to spend their lives with us. But go ahead, Tim. <laughs> yeah, so um, Benjamin, thanks for the question. And, and the short answer is I think probably not enough uh, thought has gone into the issue of physical proximity. Um, uh, and uh, uh, I think CORE has some of that in its design. Uh, you know, Teresa's on the call, and I know there are others uh, from our department who are sitting there. Uh, likewise, at the JGH, um, you know, Robert is over there, Sammy. Uh, so I think we do have a relatively decentralized capacity. I think the question, I think one of the issues is whether there are there's sufficient numbers, uh, because one of the things I I find uh, I hear is that uh, folks' uh, bandwidth is, is all used up. Um, and there is a real issue uh, on recognition. And, and, and this is something that, uh, uh, you know, biostatisticians and epidemiologists are scientists in their own right. Uh, they do pioneering work on methods and, and things, which are, are, are the way in which uh, opportunities to study complex challenges change. Uh, but often in the context of uh, uh, settings where you're trying to answer a clinical question, uh, there's a tendency for some of that methodologic expertise to be seen as purely, uh, purely as instrumental. And, and I think this is a tension in managing uh, people's careers. Uh, and, and I think we have to strike a good balance on that front, uh, which is recognition that, uh, that the, the methods people are not there as pure instruments. They're there as lead scientists. And, and we have to nurture that um, uh, equally um, in, in those settings. So I think that's part of the culture uh, that we need to create uh, or to strengthen uh, to make that work. 
But I do come back to the issue of numbers. Um, and we have had discussions uh, with respect to our research strategy, uh, which is it would be great if we could have people that uh, were dedicated to managing some of the data infrastructure, data management issues that would facilitate research. Uh, because a lot of really uh, high quality um, uh, researcher time, faculty time is sometimes taken up on issues that may not be the best use of their scarce time. So I think uh, that would be another part of, uh, if we are gonna have physical proximity, and I, and I, I hear you, the, the, the water cooler conversations and things like that often spawn tremendous uh, ideas and suggestions. So um, I'd love to explore that further, uh, but I think we should also think about it in terms of having a, what I would call a, a really virtuous relationship between uh, leaders and methods and, and leaders in practice. Um, and uh, so uh, that would be part of it as well. I, I don't wanna go on so long, but I, I just want to have this, I, I think I, I, we have a space um, for the school for the first time. So the, the, the various composite units of the school will, will all come together uh, on the 11th and 12th floor of a building uh, just in front of the McGill Gates um, uh, for the first time in September. But I would like to make a suggestion of saying, uh, perhaps we can denominate uh, or designate other areas where the school has a physical presence. And so that there isn't this sense that somehow if you're not in those two floors, you're not part of the school. Uh, so maybe the core and parts of the hospitals might be interested in and having some co-identification with the school, um, which might help on that convergence. So I just want to throw that idea. Out. I'm going to just maybe ask Rob to, to comment, because I think we do have a lot of examples of methodologists who've had outstanding careers from the hospital-based research institutes, uh, Robert Platt, Yal Aramovich, Teresa Gyurikos. I mean, I could go on and on. So I, I, this is not foreign to us. Do you want to go ahead, Rob? No, I was just going to say, I, I put a little note in the chat saying, you know, this has been my entire career and it's been really, really catalytic. And I, so I strongly, I strongly support this idea that, that Ben is proposing that if we, if we do it right, and, and Tim is alluding to an important concern about um, not being served, seen, if we want the, the methodologists to be to be researchers in their own right, they can't be seen as as a consulting service. And I think we have, you know, I'm, I'm, I think we, Sammy's in the corner of my screen. We can point to Sammy as one of the one of the earlier examples of this uh, of this too, where it's just been extraordinarily successful, provided that the buy-in comes from both both contributing parts of the of or all three contributing parts of the of the equation that the person recognizes what they're getting into the clinical department recognizes that they're getting a researcher who's going to work with their their clinical scientists and not just a consultant and the the home you know the the campus department recognizes that they're getting you know a person who is doing epi research or biostat research but is is you know at least partially as uh, connected to another department and so may have different um, you know different demands on their time than someone who's sitting in in 2001 McGill College or Purvis Hall. Nicole I think has been waiting to speak. Nicole Lezer are you still there? Yeah I'm still here. Um, I just wanted I, I didn't see in any of these uh, the organic grams or diagrams, uh, what the role of computer scientist is in the sort of vision of things moving forward. Because I think, um, you know, as a clinician scientist who's sort of straddling uh, public health uh, and, and other fields, um, I sort of struggle to understand the best way to make connections with the faculty of computer science at McGill and trainees that might be interested in the application of computer science and to health data. 
because I definitely don't have that expertise. And I'm, I'm wondering if there's been any thought towards where the vision of uh, that relationship is, because it's so hard to A, get even a student interested in these types of things and they get snatched up in industry after a year or two of a master's. Uh, and obviously we don't have as competitive uh, salaries to, to hire full-time people to do that kind of work. So I was wondering what, what your vision of uh, that is moving forward because I, I see it at least in my project becoming more and more of a issue with uh, with data science um, to have kind of computer science collaborations. Yeah, so uh, I think uh, this is an area we have uh, where we've been discussing uh, with the Department of Epi and Biostats uh, what uh, uh, a next sort of uh, area might look like, uh, one of them perhaps being in the area of informatics. Uh, and so that's under discussion. Uh, David Buckridge, uh, who's on the call here, is somebody who's been look, working on that. And I know Robert has had some discussions with folks on that. So they may want to add. My personal view is um, there's a lot of activity uh, at McGill, which is uh, uh, convergent around this. And uh, I think McGill's in a great position to, uh, uh, to provide more leadership in this area because it has excellence uh, in computing sciences and a lot of the quantitative areas that are, are increasingly complementary uh, to um, uh, Epi and Biostat. So, um, but David and, and Robert, do you want to add anything? Robin. Robin already made a comment about the, the digital health innovation concentration is, is really focusing in that area. And, and I would point out that in that context, I've already had a couple you know, emails from highly qualified undergraduates in joint statistics computer science programs, you know, looking for supervision in that program. So I think it's, you know, I think there's a demand from students to get that kind of training. And I think the more that we provide training opportunities in that area, I think that will start to bring them into our ecosystem. So I think it's starting with that, but I think we probably need to think more broadly about those kinds of uh, training opportunities. But I think uh, just on that note, David and Robin, I think we need to have a presentation at CORE on DHI because I don't think people were fully aware it's launched. So that's something, Nicole, that would be interesting to you and to many of us. Um, I think uh, I did see a couple of other names. Um, well, no, I wanted to, to, to shout out to Beth to say something because she's my, we're both Gen Xers and we've been around <laughs> for about the same amount of time. Do you want to go ahead, Beth, and make some comments? Um, oh, I wasn't expecting to be there. You go. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, I, I thank you for the presentation. It was certainly interesting to hear about all of these uh, ideas and um, and initiatives. And I'm I'm looking forward to seeing what's going to come out of it. Uh, I'm in the Department of Pediatrics, and so um, I think it will be important for the departments of both medicine and pediatrics to participate in these initiatives and. Um, I'm very on board with trying to find ways to get more methodologists in our midst in the hospital um, institutes. I've personally benefited greatly from the presence of people like Robert Platt, Andrea Benedetti, uh, Nandini, lots of people around who, who just bring the tone. They raise everything up. Uh, they make us all better and, and we need people like that. So I think that's all I'll say. <laughs> Is it there? Yes, yeah, sorry, go ahead. You know, I was just going to say, we, uh, Mike Chevelle has been part of the discussions on the trials innovation platform and, and, and some of these uh, areas, but absolutely um, uh, pediatrics important. Well, trials innovation, if you want some, Beth can give you lots, direct experience. And I have to say that the trials, so we often do our behavioral, uh, you know, sort of uh, strategy based, so they're not necessarily the drug trials that will bring in millions of dollars, but they're extremely important. So I so hope Kimberly, that it's recognized. Yeah. Yeah, Kimberly, I just want to say that's part of the reason why we avoided calling it a clinical innovations uh, okay. trial platform. So we're calling it a trials innovation. And uh, some people say they're clinical and community trials, uh, but there's a huge area of uh, trials on M health and, and other things, which, um, are in regulatory sort of um, purgatory, meaning no one really knows how to uh, decide whether something is of value or not, the criteria for it, um, regulatory. There's a whole set of issues um, where there's a lot of push 
but uh, uh, we're we're a little bit, uh, uh, you know, uh, don't have the supply to uh, understand how best to assess whether these things uh, should be recommended or not. So there's, a, I think, a, I think it's a very exciting area, um, meaning that we think about trials more broadly. More broadly, yeah, and definitely people are doing them. We're all doing them, so it would be good to have a framework mm -hmm. and a, and a structure for that. Um, Isabel Malamé, so she is a new uh, FRQS Junior One. She's a graduate of the master's program. She's based here at CORE, and I think she had some comments. Go ahead, Isabel. Uh, thank you so much, Kaberi. Well, maybe just a little comment. Um, some of us, and it may be a sort of early career bias, are still very much clinician scientists and not scientist clinicians. And that comes with all the limitations and all the sort of roles that a clinician scientist has as opposed to a non-clinician scientist. And so I, I would, I, I actually love having a less clinical centered model of research and research collaborations and thinking more to normalize um, uh, the, the role of the clinician scientist being, you know, sometimes primarily a clinician as opposed to a clinician scientist and seeing more of those collaborations and not having the non-clinical scientists as consultants, but it, it, just de putting the, the focus less on the, the clinical scientists and more on the collaboration between both parties. And I don't know if this is something because I'm in the early stages and most of what I, I've seen as a clinician scientist at my level has been clinicians who are primarily clinicians and then scientists. But um, I, I feel like I, I did not entirely agree that we successful clinician scientists can only be successful if they're uh, scientists clinicians and, and perhaps having more collaboration and understanding what are the limitations of clinicians would be great and modeling that um, for the trainees and, and de, uh, removing the focus so much on the clinician may be good in some aspects. I don't think it was intended to be. I think Sammy's point was just that there is an evolution. So you'll see as you go through the different FRQS areas, the scientist part is not going to over overwhelm the clinician side, but it'll be increasingly important. I don't know Tim, if you have a, a comment on that. No, I, but I, I just uh, I just want to go back to one thing that I thought was important for us to note from Sammy's comment related to some of the structural impediments. Uh, to, for example, the design of PREMS and uh, where people who would like to do uh, more, uh, be more active on the research front are being perhaps constrained uh, because of those structural issues. And, and I think um, these are things that um, have a policy system level uh, um, ish, uh, point of entry to be addressed, uh, but uh, they, we shouldn't take them off the, the radar screen. Um, and so uh, it's, not a, it's, it's not specific, but I think uh, providing more degrees of freedom for managing the interface between uh, research and uh, clinical duties uh, and how we do that is, is an important, um, I think, important area for, the, for those of us who may think that we should be talking to uh, Quebec City and others to 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 ask them to change, um, uh, you know, take advantage of opportunities to change um, change some of those structural issues. Actually, on that front, I don't know if uh, Mark Roger, are you still on the call? Maybe you want to make some comments. I'm calling up people like I sometimes do in classes. Maybe wrong. <laughs> but are, are you there, Mark? No, he's left. Um, and I don't know if Suzanne Morin is still there. I think there was a comment that Suzanne made. Oh, there she is. Yeah, thank you. I, my comment was really short. It had to do with the supporting of the previous statement by uh, Ben and Beth and uh, Robert that, of course, uh, as we would benefit tremendously in terms of, uh, you know, investigators, the students themselves would obviously even uh, benefit more in the ability to have close proximity between methodologists and, and clinician researchers, yeah. Maybe I'll just give a last comment to Teresa, who can tell us about life at CORE and Clinepi and how she has navigated that through an illustrious career. Go ahead, Teresa. Uh, yeah, um, certainly that's been the successful formula and I hope the formula continues because I think it is, as people have been saying, win-win. Um, yes, I'd just like to um, put in a plug for the students and um, 
I think I've heard many colleagues in core mention that they would love to have more students. Um, and I think that um, that conversation should be had. I think uh, we've just gone through an admissions process in the EBOH and um, uh, it was the regular way that we do admissions. And maybe we need to think again strategically about how we do student admissions so that we can uh, so that we can really uh, match up the needs with, uh, with the demands. Thanks. Tim, do you wanna make any closing comments? I've kept everybody 10 minutes past our usual. Yeah, <laughs> so I apologize, um, but thanks, thanks Kabiri for the opportunity. And it's great uh, to have this discussion. I hope we can continue it. And that gets back to your original question about what the best mechanism is. Uh, and so I'm open to suggestions on that front. Uh, whether it's primarily through some of the uh, initiatives that we're going to jointly pursue uh, or whether we need to have something which is a little bit more generic uh, periodically, which would uh, make sure that we're uh, keeping the big picture in focus. Uh, so uh, th that, that I, I think uh, has value. Um, I, I just think there's so much opportunity here and, and because we're, again, uh, we're not starting from scratch. We've got uh, great uh, engagement. And uh, I think uh, if we can get some of these uh, efforts moving, uh, then uh, it could be a very exciting uh, next five years for, for all of us. So uh, there are obviously lots of uh, mountains to climb on those fronts, but I think uh, 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 there's certainly not a... Um, a deficit with respect to skilled uh, mountain climbers. So uh, I look forward to uh, taking some of these things on and uh, I'd love to have uh, feedback and engagement uh, from anybody with suggestions on, on how we can do it more effectively. So uh, thanks for the opportunity. Perfect, and thank you, Tim, for joining us. And I'm sure you're gonna have a flurry of emails, um, but I hope we've, you've seen what a dynamic community we have. So please name us multiple times. Yeah.